Welcome back. So what we're doing now is we're going to undertake the technical details of calculating the free energy associated with phase separation and examining the Flory Huggins theory for its merits. And then I'm going to end with a discussion of this beautiful paper from Christoph Weber and co-workers on does equilibrium thinking work in the context of in vivo biology. So just as a reminder, you know, what we're talking about writ large is this beautiful phenomenon of membraneless organelles, phase separation in living, in living organisms and so on. And, um, and what I want to do is, you know, this is a provocative and large ambition. I want to show you, excuse me, oh, uh, I want to show you, excuse me, I, I want to show you how, um, how one can use statistical physics to undertake such a grandiose thing as to calculate a phase diagram you know, from, in some sense, from first principles. So uh, just as a reminder, I want you to imagine that we're going to pipette at some concentration, which I'm going to call phi pipette or phi pipetted. And we're interested in the terminal privilege state, the so-called equilibrium state, in which the system segregates into two different phases, one at concentration of red phi prime and one at concentration of red phi double prime. And what we want to find out is two things. What is phi prime and what is phi double prime? In other words, what choice of phi prime and phi double prime will lead to the lowest free energy for the system? And also, what are the F and 1 minus F? This is that lever rule thing. Okay, so what we're going to do, as I mentioned, I'm having some technical difficulties, so I'm not able to calculate this for you in real time as much as that's what I would like to do. And I think it would be more pedagogically satisfying, but I'm going to walk you through what I wrote out this morning just when I realized that I wouldn't be able to do this the way that I hoped. So we're going to write down a free energy. The free energy is going to depend on phi, which is the fraction of molecules that are red. So phi, as you can see on the right here, is defined as nr of phi divided by n tot. So that's how many red molecules there are divided by the total number of molecules. So this is the number fraction, the way that I'm writing it. So we want to write down a free energy. I'm going to write that free energy as an energetic part minus uh, an entropic part. Note, I do know the difference between the Gibbs free energy and the Helmholtz free energy, and I'm intentionally being sloppy about it. I'm not going to worry about the difference between those two because the issue of pressure and volume and stuff is like an extra layer of, of nuance that's irrelevant to our enterprise, which is just understanding how the free energy ends up being a competition between the entropic pieces and the energetic pieces. So how do we obtain the energy? I already mentioned this this morning, but now I'm gonna do it in a little bit more detail. First, I'm going to assert that the total energy is given as a sum over all pairs of atoms, and presumably I'm gonna do only near neighbors, okay? So the reason for the one half in front is that tells us sum over all i and j, and so I will double count because v12 is the same as v21, so I get it two times, and I thus divide by, uh, divide by one half because I've double counted. So my VIJ is really amount to only three things. There's VRR for red, red, there's VBB for blue, blue, and then there's VRB for blue, red, blue. And what we wanna do is we wanna calculate the total energy of the system. There's a total of N atoms in the system, and I want you to imagine that it's so large that the surfaces don't matter, or even easier that I have periodic boundary conditions, which is to say, there aren't any surface atoms. Every atom has its six neighbors, if I'm on a simple cubic lattice, et cetera. So to get, to get the total energy, note what I've written. N tot times Z divided by two. What I'm saying is that uh, if I have every atom is identical, then to get the total energy, I just multiply the energy of one atom times the number of atoms. And that's what I'm doing here. How many atoms are there? N tot. Or how many molecules? N tot. I, don't, I shouldn't be calling it atom. The, how many objects? So these are effective objects. Z is the coordination number. That means how many near neighbors do I have? So if I have six near neighbors, then the total number of bonds that I'm gonna add up and assign to myself is three because I have six pairs of uh, interaction energies, but those are shared equally between me and my neighbors. And so I have six neighbors. And so I actually get three times the, the V effective. The V effective is shown here. Why do I choose this? The probability of on one site getting a red, let's say this site, and then on the next site getting a red, the probability of getting the red in the first place is phi, and the probability of getting it again is a phi, and so the probability of getting two in a row is phi squared. So that's, that's what I have in mind uh, in writing things this way. 
So this guy, this first term right here, is the red-red interaction. This one is blue-blue, which occurs with probability 1 minus phi squared. And then finally, this is the, the red-blue, the factor of 2 here, appears because I can either choose red first and then blue, or I can choose blue first and, re and then red. And that's the same pair, so I, I'm double counting. So that's the energy. That's it. And, and note that here I'm plotting what that energy will look like as a function of the volume fraction of red. So that's very nice. So we've achieved the first of these two terms in the Flory-Huggins theory. And now we want to do the next one, which is the entropy. The entropy is a question of how many ways can I arrange all of the guys in this lattice? And the answer to that depends on how many reds and how many blues there are. And now I'm just invoking Boltzmann's S equals K log W in the usual way. And so the whole trick comes down to figuring out what W is, which is the number of ways of rearranging the NR and NB um, molecules or atoms or whatever it is they are. And I can do that uh, as follows. So I want to take the logarithm of this expression right here. To do so, I use the Stirling approximation, which is S, sorry, which is log of n factorial is n log n minus n. This is something I derived for you uh, earlier in the term, so I'm not going to repeat it. So I can unpack this logarithm. There's a numerator and there's a denominator. I unpack it using the rule log of a over b is log a minus log b. So I do that, and here's the unpacking that you see right here. Now I can take that further because the nr plus nbs all cancel out. I'm just with, left with the logarithms. And then, you know, in the usual sort of Michelangelo sense, this thing wants to be something. We need to recognize what this mathematics wants to be. And so, you know, I, I expand out this term. In other words, I use the distributive properties of multiplication to expand that thing out. And I'm confronted with the next line. And then this next line, I notice that there's two terms that have nr in front. So I, I basically can rewrite all of this as shown in this line right here. So I encourage you to do the algebra yourself in going from the top line to this line here. But now, and note what I did, I factored out an nr plus nb, but to do that I had to divide by nr plus nb as well, which I've done, and then I just use the definition of phi. Remember that phi is nr over nr plus nb. That means 1 minus phi is nb over nr plus nb. So I'm left with this very beautiful expression right here for the entropy. That is the classic entropy of mixing. So this is the entropy that you'd get from the Shannon uh, information theory approach to a two-state system. It's the entropy associated with coin flips, but it's also the entropy of mixing for binary solutions. And so what we've achieved is we've got now a total free energy. I normalize it by n tote KBT for convenience. Didn't have to do that, but I did. And now I have uh, the entropy term, uh, which is these first two pieces. So that's entropy. And then this piece right here is the energy. And down in this plot, I show you the energy, the entropy, and how they compete with each other and together they give a free energy, which is the green curve. Note that there are two minima in the green curve. What that means, here's the intuition that I want you to have. What that means is that if I pipe that in at a concentration, say, like right here, what that tells me is that I can actually get a lower free energy by letting the system have a little bit over here and a little bit over there and connecting them by a tie line. Okay, I'm not able to draw this very well with my, my uh, I, um, with my um, cursor, but the bottom line is I hope you will see that you know what we've done is we've showed that the uniform state at concentration phi pipette is inferior in terms of free energy to the state in which we have phase separation. All right, so let's pursue this a little bit more. To pursue this a little bit more, we, we next need to figure out the so-called lever rule. The lever rule is exactly what you think it is. And what I mean by that is that if I'm going to divide the system up into two parts, one of which is blue rich, shown here on the left, and one of which is red rich, shown here on the right, if I'm going to do that division, I have to do it in such a way that the total number of red atoms is the same as it was in the pipetted solution. 
and that the total number of blue atoms is the same as it was in the pipetted blue solution. Uh, sorry, in the original pipetted solution. And so how do we work this out? So what I know is that if I take the fraction F at concentration phi prime plus one minus that fraction times the concentration of red at phi double prime, and I multiply by n tot, that's the total number of red atoms. But that's the same as what we called earlier nr of phi, which is the same as phi pipette times n tot. So I have this very simple relationship, which tells me how to relate phi prime, phi double prime, and phi pipette. Just to be clear, what I'm saying is that for any phi pipette, I can now find two concentrations, one on the right and one on the left of phi pipette, such that I will conserve mass as long as I choose the relative amounts of those two uh, phi prime and phi double primes, such that I respect mass conservation. And so this is what the lever rule does, because if you take this expression that I have right here, and again, this is for you to do algebraically. If I were in class, I would just do it on the board. But this thing, solve for f. If you do, what you will find is this result right here. That's the result of solving for the fraction that's going to be phi prime. And by definition, therefore, the fraction is going to be phi double prime. And again, this is nothing more than imposing mass conservation. So what, I, what, am, what am I telling you? I pipette in at phi, pipette. And now I imagine the system separating into a, a, a red rich and a blue rich region. And the red rich is described by a concentration phi prime. The blue rich is described by a concentration phi double prime. And I can choose those however I want. But once I choose them, then this quantity f, little f, which is the lever rule fraction, that has to is inviolate. It, it is absolutely mandatory in order to satisfy conservation of mass. The last thing I want to say uh, is shown here, which is how do we obtain the phi phase diagram? So my point is that every choice of phi prime and phi double prime, there's, a, there's a basically a diagram of all phi primes and all phi double primes. Okay, I can choose those, those two concentrations given a certain phi pipette. And I'm saying we have a rule that tells us how to calculate the free energy of the tie line, if you like. How do we do that? We take a weighted average, as I show you here, of the free energy at phi prime and the free energy at phi double prime. That's what this is. This is a weighted average. It's saying some of the atoms are going to be in the phi prime state, and so they have a free energy f of phi prime. Some of the atoms, or molecules, or whatever, are going to be in the f in the phi double prime state, and they will have a free energy f of phi, f, f of phi double prime. Those two concentrations, uh, sorry, those two, two solutions, or those two to phase separated regimes have to come at a weighting such that the total number of red atoms is respected. I can always rewrite this. I just used the, um, the lever rule to find little f. So I can rewrite the free energy as I show you here. And what I've got is a function f, which depends on phi prime and phi double prime, and respects the fact that when I do the phi prime and the phi double prime, that I will have the right number of red atoms. So what I'm showing you now is, now all we have to do is just minimize this free energy with respect to phi prime and phi double prime. In the whole plane, find that choice of phi prime and phi double prime that lead to the lowest free energy at a given temperature. Note that our free energy that we wrote down a few minutes ago, that free energy depends on temperature right here. You see this? So there's a temperature here and there's a temperature there. So those two contributions end up mattering for, uh, for the relative note on the right hand side. There's no temperature multiplying phi log phi plus one minus phi log one minus phi, but there's a one over temperature for the energy term. How do I interpret that? The higher the temperature gets, the less important the energy is to the free energy. The more and more entropy is going to dominate the conversation. So that's what that temperature is doing. Is it's weighting the relative importance of energy and entropy. And so this diagram shows the free energy surface as a function of phi and phi double prime at temperature 200 K. This one shows a 250. 
This one shows at 300. And for each one of those choices, there's a minimizer. There's a particular phi and phi double prime, which minimizes the free energy. And that's shown down here. Note, you know, here's phi prime and here's phi double prime. Those are the outcome of free energy minimization. So that's telling me where the phase boundaries are. And that will depend on temperature. And you can see that as I increase the temperature, then I change the values of phi prime and phi double prime, interestingly. Okay, so that's, that's, all, um, that's all really fun and interesting. So what have I told you? I've basically given you a sketch of how to use statistical mechanics to compute a phase diagram. Here's an alternative interpretation. I kind of already hinted at this earlier. Each one of these curves corresponds to a different temperature. And these minima, the minima of these curves is not where you, um, where, where you find the phi prime and phi double prime. It's actually, you can prove, I didn't prove it, I have proved it, but I'm not gonna put it in these notes. Um, you can prove that the condition is that you want the, a common tangent. You want the slope over here to be equal to the slope over there. That turns out to be the free energy minimizer. And that corresponds to these points that you see in the phase diagram. So, you know, here, these, this point up here is this point down here, and so on. So, okay, we've, we've basically attacked the problem of phase separation from a statistical mechanics point of view. Now let's actually turn to this beautiful paper that's really the reason I decided to give this final set of vignettes uh, on technical content. So you can see the, the paper is entitled Local Thermodynamics Governs the Formation and Dissolution of Protein Condensates in Living Cells. So figure one is already mind-blowing. What they're showing you in part B is that they can cycle the temperature, and as they do so, the, the phase-separated droplets are present, and then absent, and then present again. So you know they're moving back and forth in temperature space exactly the way that I was just talking about. I am not going to go into the, the, all the technical details of what's involved here. I'm just going to get sketch for you what they claim. This is a really beautiful result. And part at the top, what they're showing us in the gray, this gray curve is the total volume of condensate of phase-separated regions. Now, how do they do that? They, phase, they basically segment their image and they add up the regions that are lit up, like you see in part B. So they, that, that's fine. The other curve, this one, the one with the tall peaks, that's the temperature. So what they're doing, as you can see over here on the right, is they're cycling the temperature on a very modest or fast time scale, I should say. So you know, on the order of a couple of minutes, uh, they're re reversibly creating phase-separated droplets and then melting them, if you want to think of it that way, and then letting them form again and then melting them. And they're doing that over and over and over again. There's a slight increase in the total volume, and I'm not going to touch on that, but that's also interesting. Then the part that I think is, in a certain sense, the most amazing of all is that they, um, they actually proceed to measure the phase diagram. They find the concentration inside of the droplet and they find the concentration outside of the droplet. Let's see if I can magnify this a little bit more so you can see better. So as you see over here on the right-hand side, what they do is they look at a, so you know, they look at one of these regions that's orangish, and they measure the total fluorescence. And then they go into the sort of turquoise region shown in the, over here, and that's the, the concentration of the fluorescent protein outside of the condensate. On the x-axis of part B, you see that they actually are plotting this in true actual concentration units. And the way that they make the mapping between fluorescence intensity and concentration, sorry, and actual concentration is they did a calibration ahead of time, which is awesome. So, you know, they, they, they've gotten out of the world of artificial units, uh, fluorescence intensities, and mapped it onto actual micromolar units. And then what they do is they increase the temperature and then they measure the concentration inside of the droplets and in, and in the exterior medium and then they make this plot. So the plot is basically showing the phase diagram as they increase the temperature. Uh, the worms are, I think, happy at 19 degrees is what one of my book co-authors told me today. And, um, and so, you know, they're moving kind of around the physiological range 
but you know, most importantly, they're, they're able to identify the phase boundaries in an actual phase diagram inside of a living cell. I really recommend this paper to you. you know, they have other things to say in here. For example, they look at heat transfer in a very nice way to try and understand whether the conditions for equilibrium are actually met. And you know, bot bottom line is that this is a huge subject. I could have spent five weeks on phase separation alone trying to be careful about the statistical mechanics, giving you all the details. And, you know, I, I think in some sense, the way that I think about what I've done on a lot of the technical content in the course is to give you sort of technical tourism and without ever making the claim that, you know, watching me do this is gonna permit you to do it yourselves without some practice. You know, we could go surfing or go snowboarding or go mountain biking or whatever. and you know, if you've never done it before and you go with somebody that has, there's just no way that watching them is going to allow you after a first try to, to match their performance. Not that I have any great performance in any of those things or this, but I'm just saying, you know, that I've, I've gone through every calculation in, in detail and I'm thinking that you should do the same. So that's the end of what I wanted to say about phase separation and, and now what we'll do is we'll turn to a few more